Owning a restaurant was these people's dream. We've always said, we'll start a restaurant. Some invested everything. We put 50,000 into the business. Busting their guts to make it work. Priority is to pay my staff. I do have sleep this night. But it's a ruthless business. Four minute steaks for table five. It's an element of survival. We've just been living off credit cards. I can't pay my bills. I'm so completely consumed. I've seen him in tears. I've seen him not be able to eat. It's business or marriage. And with so many big brands crowding the high street, the pressure is greater than ever. I don't know how we're going to cope. I'm Alex Polizzi. Hello, hello. Having set up and managed successful restaurants around the world... Let's get on with it, then. Yeah. I want to try and help struggling owners sort out theirs. You want to entice people in. It's too big because that slows down service, doesn't it? It does. It would be practical to have it here and it will separate off the room a bit. You obviously struggle with customers at lunchtime. Yeah. God, yeah. We're going to have to unpick this. It won't be easy. No, mate, no. I think it's the nerves that are getting the better of me. But if I can bring some inspiration... Why don't you do an offer and say, subscribe to the supper club? And they, some hard work and determination... Chicken tikka, one puri. Excited to get it to work for us. There you go. It feels a lot more curated as a menu. It's awesome. amazing. Can I turn things around and leave them a lasting legacy? Look at this. Are you happy? Absolutely. And this is what a restaurant should be like. I love it. I'm seeing what we could do and be more positive about it. Check. The restaurant feels it's got a brighter future. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs>so unbelievably tight at the moment financially. We're running at a loss. Malk and I don't take any money, we don't take a wage. Uh, the past couple of years, we've just been living off credit cards, you know, and we've just, the credit cards are just going up and up and up. The reality also of three kids under the age of six years old is hard. Mom? We got the crucial years with our children, and it worries me what we're setting them up for. As I run both a business and a family myself, this is a challenging cry for help I simply can't ignore. Here we are. The nook and cranny restaurant, car park at rear. Hi, Christy. Hi, Alex. Very nice to meet you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. OK, here I am at your baby. Tell me why you bought this place because my husband wanted to so you had yeah, i see so you were dragged along yes very much kicking and screaming hello there you you're go. in oh, trouble thanks. already and we're I, all <laughs> I say i don't know so anything nice about. to meet you pleased to meet you lovely to meet you why hello. why did you buy this place um dream come true try and create a successful business so you've got background in restaurants all your life i take it you don't you absolutely not. none whatsoever the 60 cover restaurant hasn't made any profit since it opened and now christine has been roped into the business getting a restaurant manager in was too much so christine stepped in now she's doing as many hours as i have to it's like a massive black hole that has pulled us all in 
The restaurant may be Malcolm's dream, but I'm already concerned it's become Sorry, Christine's please. nightmare. Is there anything you like about the business? From my perspective, I physically can't be a mum. It's spreading myself too thinly. I have no choice. I have to... All right, darling. I, I understand. It's just, it's exhausting. It's just like I have to let someone down just to try and do this. And it'd be like my, my children, my little ones, my big ones, my family, my friends don't see anyone. And so we just, we're so completely consumed. So that's why I'm here, isn't it? I'm yes. to try and see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to try and help you find a path through the thicket kind of thing. I see the biggest problem in the fact that you're not making money. Mm. Because when you're making money, then you can employ people. At the moment, you don't have that luxury. Yes. With Christine in crisis, the first big issue I need to resolve is generating a profit from the Nook and Cranny's menu. I've taken a brief look at the accounts, and any restaurant worth its salt would be delivering a food gross profit, or GP, of around 70% but I've spotted Malcolm's is worryingly low. I mean, certainly on the P&L that I saw yes. from May to July, you're making 37% GP. Horrible. Which is where I imagine quite a lot of your problems start from. It's where focus lies, you know. I've been handed a sheet, profit and loss, the same one that you've looked over. You know, the figures are there in black and white, so it's almost a sense of denial. Making profit from your food is restaurant rule number one. So we'll need to help Malcolm nail this, getting familiar with his figures. Delicious. All good? Mm. I've got no doubt that you can cook. What I'm here to do is make sure you start focusing on some of the things that make you a business owner rather than just a chef. Yeah. Hello. Bye. We're into year three. We're struggling. I'm working 17, 18-hour days. So the actual management and business ownership is 100% neglected and not happening. So uh, if there's advice to help implement some sort of structure, then amen, bring it on. And it's not just his food calculations missing the mark. Outside, I've spotted a problem with the restaurant's identity. So I just wanted to point out to you, I think, how this appears. First of all, the nook and cranny sounds like it's a tea room. Does it not? That there looks like a pub A board. You've got something that suggests it's a coffee shop. Very mixed messages. People are chicken. People are a bit shy. And I think we need to sell the fact that this is a restaurant. Mm. And we have to sell it as a location. And we have to sell it as something, you know, really appealing. You want to entice people in. And I don't think at the moment all of this is doing that. Are they all home? Yes. Normally, my focus is solely on helping the business. But Malcolm and Christine have invited me back home to meet some of their seven children, whose livelihood depends on the success of the restaurant. Oh, it's Daddy. Daddy in the daytime, look. Hello, 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 hi. I have three older daughters from my first marriage, and then Malcolm and I have three very young children, five, three and two-year-olds. And then I have Evan from my first marriage, who's 12. I don't know how you do it. I'm really admiring, I must say. It's just, you've got a choice, haven't you? We've chosen this path, so we've just got to get on. So would your ideal be that you don't have to work there at all? Um, no, because in my head, it'd obviously be picking up shifts that needed covering, or it would actually be just coming along to support and oversee what was going on. But my primary concern would be my family. So what happened on the first day of opening? We'd opened for Christmas Day. It was possibly one of our first services. Oh. The buzz and excitement was there. You know, we'd started to gather a bit of momentum. And then? April, May time, it kind of slumped. You hit those ruts, you really start to question if... Uh, you know, if you've done the right thing. I think the thing is, actually, I see enormous potential in your restaurant. To make this work for you guys, when it works, a little business, you do manage to still to get away a bit more yeah. and yeah. control a bit more which bits you do and which bits you don't. But now you need to concentrate and you need to focus. There's a lot at stake here. So the quicker we can help the business, 
the sooner Christine can return to focusing on the family. I think you're doing an amazing job. You've got an immaculate house, lovely children, oh, and a you. great relationship with your husband. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll be back next week. You know, it is amazing. They seem to be able to cope with an awful lot more than most people. You know, have got a house full of children, and I suppose that's the value of coming here. It's the fact of bringing it home to me. You know, how important it is that I help Nook and Cranny be more successful. Straight away, I've identified key areas for concern. For starters, we'll need to help tackle the lack of profit on food and the restaurant's confused identity. I'm looking forward to the next few months. Our business can evolve, and we can start to make some money and uh, formulate a winning business plan that actually works this time around. So, yeah, fingers crossed. I was quite impressed with the food that I saw at the Nook and Cranny yesterday, but I want to analyse it a bit more closely. And today, the work begins. So, I have a plan to bring in some extra help and a surprise for Malcolm. Good afternoon, the Nook and Cranny. Hi, it's Alex Polizzi. Hello, Alex. Um, well, I'm working with someone on your restaurant who is yes. my brother-in-law, Oliver Payton. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Oliver Payton, mm, let me see. Yes, I do know Mr Payton. It's going to be his role to take a closer look and an analysis of food. And okay. he's, he's just around the corner. He should be with you any minute. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, thank you for the notice. I'm sure he'll love your food, darling. All right. Thanks, Alex, and I'll speak to you real soon. Bye. Talk, talk to you soon. Bye, darling. Bye, bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, come on. I've been called in to help the Nook and Cranny, where owners Malcolm and Christine have failed to see a profit since opening three years ago. It's critical now, you know. It, it's nasty to be in a situation where you feel like there's no way out. This is a big challenge, which starts by tackling the unprofitable menu. And helping us along the way is acclaimed restaurateur Oliver Payton. You know, Oliver really has a food knowledge that's admirable. And it's really important to have someone whose opinion I can completely trust. He just happens to be my brother-in-law. Malcolm. Hi. Hi, Oliver. You all right? Nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, just about. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice smell in here. You know, I always get a sense when I go into places if it's going to be good or not. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting a good feeling. So far, so good. So far, so good. Everyone loves a fish cake. Yes. <laughs> Biggest selling dish, right? By a country mile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did I know that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to go. I'm going to go and eat. We'll, I'll speak to you afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. Right. Oliver's years of experience in menu construction will help pinpoint why Malcolm's menu isn't making a profit and how to fix it. The three things I look for in the menu are balance, provenance and price. Balance to make sure that the right dishes are on the menu for everybody's requirements. Provenance to make sure the chef has sourced good ingredients. And price to make sure they're suitable to the marketplace. You have to have a graduating price list. Malcolm's varied menu offers a choice from Thai fish cakes to mushroom burgers and lamb fillets to falafels. I do think there's a lot of different styles going on. I and mean, one of the things you always have to consider is restraint. I mean, do I, do I need to do this? Because it just creates more jobs for yourself and just makes your life a lot, lot tougher. Main course dishes range from 15 to 32 pounds. Can I get you anything else at all? No, that's... Perfect. Enjoy. There's a lot of work gone into the lamb dish here. Um, also, there is a lot of lamb on this dish. You know, it's lunchtime. Am I really going to want to knock away such a huge portion of lamb? I don't think so. I'm going to have to have a little snooze afterwards. Mm, that lamb tastes delicious. Hey, Malcolm. Hi, Oliver. How are you? Better now. Good. I'm full. Me too. Me too. Lots of food. The lamb tastes good. I mean, it's a very big dish for uh, for, for the money, though. I mean, yeah, ri rich and generous. But we're rich right. and generous. You can obviously cook. About, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, it's it, it's a common problem. You know, the the quality of the cooking doesn't really tell you whether the restaurant's going to be successful or not. Making a menu, making nice food, yeah. is 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 a very small part of it, unless you know you know, how much it costs. I don't think your problem is the cooking, but, you know, we need to, we need to solve all those things. 
Helping Markham calculate the cost of a meal will enable him to price his menu to guarantee making a profit on every dish. Another double shift today, work the day and then work the evening. The 60 Cover Nook and Cranny restaurant is positioned on a country lane junction. We've got a village about a mile down the road that way. You've got a busy town centre about five miles that way. Based on where we are, we should be doing a lot better. Though rural, it's not to say there isn't a local crowd to attract. And Oliver and I think the nook and cranny could be missing a backbone to the business with a lack of local returning customers. So a week later, we return with a strategy. So the plan today is that we're going to divide and conquer a little bit. Oliver? Uh, we are going to go out and we are going to see all of your local customers and we're going to bring them in for dinner tonight. And also, we're going to get their reaction, more importantly, yeah. to what their perception about the nook and cranny is. If we want to embed this in the local community, we have to get the locals' opinions about what they want. Better get ready for a busy service. Oliver and Christine head just a mile down the road to a holiday park. Many of the potential 1,500 guests who holiday here nearly all year round must pass directly by the restaurant to get there. Have you heard of a place called the nook? Nook and Cranny, yeah. yes, just down the road. Have you been? No, we haven't. We're about to change all of that yeah. for you. Tonight, we would like to invite you down to the restaurant and taste my husband's wonderful food. We're going to meet a bit later on, just down at the reception. We're going to drive down. This challenge of inviting the locals will also be an opportunity for us to find the fault lines during a busy service. I'm an old school chef. Whatever it is, whatever they choose to eat this evening, I'm all over it. While Malcolm rises to the challenge, I want to see how much footfall passes by the restaurant. Last time I was here, it really struck me just how many cyclists, dog walkers, cars they were passing by. So, using an old-fashioned method, I'm going to count them. I never forget my grandfather, who was Charles Forte, told me that before he took on the Café Royal, which was his first really big site on Piccadilly, that he stood outside it with a clicker and literally counted the numbers of people who passed by to see if there was going to be enough passing trade to fill this establishment. On a dog walker. In half an hour, 69 people go past. This is obvious a sign to me that we need to capture their attention, A, by better signage, B, by tempting them in with offers, and C, by reaching out to them. You, know, you cannot just expect people to come because you're here. But for this evening, it's not taken Christine long to gather some local customers literally from on their doorstep. Hello and welcome. Making a profit on food is just a part of what makes a successful restaurant. So this challenge will help us find any other issues by scrutinizing the service from back in the kitchen to front of house. We have customers. Hooray! We have customers. <laughs> Do come in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do come in. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so can I ask yes. four of you to sit here, please? Do sit down. Yeah? Yes, yes, whatever. Well, there's quite a lot of people there. There's about 14, 16 people. Let's bring it on. OK, darling. Bye. My daughter's unhappy about babysitting. But just as service gets underway, Christine's attention is diverted from her duty by a family issue. Uh, had it. Yes. Lewis is already set up down there. What about if Maddie phones Nikki and says she's here? Yeah, fine, fine, fine. We've got beer on draft, if you'd like a pint. But once childminding is sorted, it's not long before another problem rises to the surface. Speckled hen. Speckled hen. Do you know what? I'm sure I've said speckled hen, and I'm sure we're out of that one. I'll double check. It might be London Pride instead is one of them. No matter how good the food is, the front of house must be even better if you want locals to keep coming back. But though Christine delivers service with a smile, there's further cause for concern. 
you've got free hand to kind of cast liver. So exactly. So how am I supposed to know how are you supposed to know who's having what? Yeah, in that case I don't so it works on a <laughs> table or two and after that. Okay, so that's something we could work on because you want a system, especially when it's busy yes. and it isn't just you serving. You know? Yeah. So I should be able to look at that if they call service and wash okay. in and put things down. Free chips down. If the I'll front of house is to cater for an increase in customers, we'll need to tackle the restaurant layout. This is completely useless to yes. all concerned. I mean, what you need is somewhere where everything, and where the menus are on the top, the cutlery is on the bottom, the glasses are underneath. You could, you've got to be practical. Assuming you're packed, you've got to do things to make your life easy, because actually all this is the boring bit. The clever bit is upselling, talking to your customers, making sure they have a nice time. Meanwhile, Oliver is keeping a close eye on the efficiency of the compact kitchen. Is that the last order? Yes. Ignore all the squiggles over it. You know, the costings of the menu, there, and portion size and menu structure, is really important. Yeah. If Malcolm's food is to make money, we'll need to help him make a breakthrough with calculating the right food profit, which means there's enough margin between the cost of the ingredients and menu price of the meal. I haven't scripted this set menu. I've kind of just, you know, no. so that's where it could be the colander effect, where I'm just sifting yes. money out. My general overview is Malcolm's great. He wants to cook great food. He's really enthusiastic. But, you know, he's going to have to rationalise his menus. We also have to structure the menu so he's doing less on the plate. I think it's very keen that it's a tiny kitchen, so it has to be a manageable menu. I had the salmon and the sourdough mm -hmm. with poached egg, and I found that combination of flavours lovely. I cannot fault it at all. Really, really, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm not surprised the food is going down well. So why aren't the locals using their locals? Have you been here before? No, no, this is the first time. We've always passed it and never come in. I mean, we've looked at it a few times, but sort of a, oh, it's never looked open some of the time, so we've never bothered. Yes, thanks. There's real potential for the Nook and Cranny to be the local go-to restaurant, but tonight's test has dished up plenty of food for thought. OK, so my opinion is there's not an enormous amount of experience in front of house. It needs to be much more streamlined. It needs to be much more efficient. It just feels a bit haphazard. I think today what I found overwhelming is what I've learned. I've gone along with this for the right thinking. Malk's food is what's important, Outback is. And I think today it just seems a lot of pressure. I'm sorry, darling. I didn't mean to... I'm not meaning to make you cry. I'm trying to say this nicely, but this place needs a bit of shaking into shape. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that you really, you know, you clearly don't, don't really want to be the one to do it. Oh, it's like I'm just tired. Yeah. I know. But the truth is, you have to rise again to fight tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the bloody next day until you either fold or this place becomes a success. I think you have a narrow window of opportunity here. Me too. Uh, you know, I think potentially this could be a great place. You have to give it a chance. You know, I think the menu's got to be a lot smaller. Redo it in a much simpler, high-speed manner. You need, you need local produce on there. You charge a better price for it. It just needs to be better and less. I mean, the fact that Mark can cook is essential. But you have to get people here to understand that he can cook, because otherwise you're cooking for the angels. We now know there is a local market out there. We just need to tap into it with a new profitable menu, a clearer identity, and a strategy to encourage a loyal returning crowd. This is Malcolm's dream. It's not mine, but I'm thinking I've got to probably fully jump across, especially for the next few months, and actually learn to maybe love this place as much, definitely not as much as you, but maybe a little more than what I currently do. <laughs> I'm helping the Nook and Cranny, where Chef Malcolm's dream of owning a successful restaurant to provide for wife Christine... In a minute you wanted toast. ...and their seven children... You go right here. Make sure the door doesn't close. ...has turned sour. You can't make decisions. You can't fix it all when you're just absolutely broken, tired. I've called on the expertise of restaurateur Oliver Payton, who spotted the unprofitable menu is unbalanced with too much on the plate. But Malcolm's been quick to start making amends. The immediate feedback I got back was that there's too much stove work for the starters, so it's too much cooking. 
you know, it needs to be out a lot quicker, a lot simpler, let the ingredients do the talking. It's just, you know, keep it simple so you can quickly fire those out and then have a bit more time to work on the, uh, on the stove work for the main courses. It's encouraging to hear Malcolm now thinking more practically and with business in mind. But there's a lot more to do. So a week later, I'm back. I think the challenge today is to really move things along. Um, I think we need to tackle the kind of confusing name. Um, I want to get Malcolm to start thinking about his food more and about his customers. But first, I want to check in on Christine, having given her some tough love last time we met. So are you feeling a bit more positive about everything? Certainly more positive. Uh, for me, I was desperate for some direction. I was desperate for us to have the courage of our conviction with what we want to create. So the fact that we are off and we're moving forward is, is great for me. Good, I'm so pleased. I know that there's still quite a lot to do, mm. but I think getting the, the initial elements right is so important because you can't drive a business forward unless you're completely confident about the product and about how you're presenting yourself. Then we need to market, then we need to fill the restaurant. Well, Christine buys my plan. Now I just need the locals to buy into the restaurant. So, the big conversation we're going to have now is I think it's time to change your name from the Nook and Cranny. It sounds very old-fashioned. It sounds like a tea room. It needs to be a lot more descriptive. A new name will help draw attention and promote a clear message to the surprising amount of passing trade I counted with my clicker. What do you think about calling it the Nook and then a descriptive? But you'd want the Nook Eating house. So you can, it, yeah, you can see a logo yeah. almost beyond that. To work with a new name, we'll make over the tea room styled interior and redesign that haphazard layout. First of all, let me see the menu okay. as it stands. And using Oliver's feedback, Malcolm's been giving his menu a makeover too. I really like the sound of cauliflower soup with coriol and parmesan. Chalkstream farm trout, yummy, but still very much in your vein. Mm. But it, it feels a lot more curated as a menu. Does it? Yeah, it's awesome. amazing. This the, is good, yeah. The, the difference. Yeah. I think the one thing that we could still win on, that you're not doing enough there, is the seasonality thing. Mm -hmm. It allows you to put products on that are seasonal and have a very good GP for you. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I want to tackle next. So, get your wellies on. We're going to go and see Farmer Giles. We've already established Malcolm's food profit is suffering at almost half the necessary 70%. But, using the right produce, he could keep costs down while maximising his profits. Seasonal fruit and veg is so cheap because there's a glut of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good selling point. Absolutely. It's for regular customers and they can be guaranteed to see something new on the menu. And very, very local. Very local, exactly. A whopping 80% of consumers think it's important to buy locally sourced food. So we've come just a mile down the road to meet farmer Mark Harris. We are trying to formulate a new kind of menu that, right. that emphasises the seasonal and local produce. OK. We do a lot of fruit, as in strawberries and raspberries, which are seasonal. Are you growing pumpkins? We're too? growing pumpkins also. So if we wanted to buy a couple of pumpkins from, from you, what kind of prices are you charging? Somewhere around about 30 pence a pound direct out. Trade-wise, it would be a bit cheaper, probably 15 to 20 pence a pound. So it's cheap. You know, it's, it's a very cheap mm. way of something that you can do quite a lot with. Can we go and get some? I think, I think you should take a couple of smaller ones and a couple of larger ones. Yeah, I do too. We like... That's a good-looking one, that's, yeah. That's They're a bit muddy, but... It's all right. Don't mind a bit of mud. You know, you get a vibe and you get excited you know, upon seeing this kind of thing, rather than just your produce from, you know, potentially thousands of miles away. So, yeah, this is, this is really where it's at. Of course, it's exciting also knowing that I'm actually going to save money. Then, in turn, I might actually start making some. So, uh, you know, who <laughs> wouldn't be excited by that? I'm thrilled Malcolm's feeling inspired because it's back to the kitchen to see if he can turn our cut-price produce into a profitable dish. Why don't you try and make something like a soup? Something not too complicated. Yep, sounds good. Generous, hearty. Yes. Local, seasonal. <laughs> making you lots of money. Absolutely. And then um, I get to eat it for lunch. How does that sound? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, great. OK, so let's assume each pumpkin costs £2 a pumpkin. You can make quite a lot of soup with 
two pounds worth of pumpkin. Yeah. You put something like that on the menu for four or five pounds. I mean, you could do soup and a roll, couldn't you, for fiver? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll be quids in. Using local ingredients in season will definitely help Malcolm make money. That is delicious. But we're far from any taste of success just yet. Mm. Though that could begin with a strategy to build loyalty with the locals. Why don't you do an offer um, and say, we're going to do, on a Tuesday night, this is the first example of our seasonal supper club. Ideally, you'd do a menu for, I don't know, £35 or £30 or something like that, something reasonable mm. that involves three courses, seasonal produce, being clever, doing something like this to start with, yeah. and a rhubarb something to finish with, because we all know that there's lots of it around, so you make a decent GP on it. Mm. And then say, please let us know if you'd like to subscribe to the supper club. Challenging them to set up a supper club with a fixed price set menu could create regular local business in the long run. They seem much happier than they were last time I was here. I mean, I'm under no illusions. <laughs> Malcolm's designed a menu but hasn't costed it out. And we've still got to see them fill the place. Hello. A few days later, to gain some inspiration, Malcolm and Christine Hello. book a table Malcolm. at the Secret Supper Society hosted by Jules and Nick. After you. After you. One of the first in the UK, eight years later, their home restaurant events are booked up months in advance. I hope you all have a lovely evening. Come make yourselves at home and don't hesitate to ask for anything. Thank you. Thank you. A supper club offering a set menu could create a regular event for the Nooks locals and be a backbone to the business. And with it being prepaid, Malcolm will be able to budget accordingly and make money. All you've got to do is tap into the people that enjoy the experience. Mm. They will maybe book a table of two, and the next time they come back, they'll then book a table of six or eight. Yeah. We came here for the first time in 2011. The environment is so warm and so friendly and inviting, and we just loved it, and we've come back time and again. It's given me a real insight anyway, that whole personal touch, the inviting feeling, um, going out, speaking to people, not being that hidden man uh, behind the scenes in the kitchen. So, we would like you to join us on All Hallows' Eve for our very first Secret Supper Club. This will be a chance for us to showcase some of the best local ingredients in season right now. Inspired by the Secret Supper Club, Malcolm has wasted no time designing the flyers for his first supper club with a fully costed seasonal menu. So these are the new menus I've been working on with Oliver. So I've got some spiced pumpkin soup with curry oil and toasted seeds. Uh, we've embraced Isle of Wight tomatoes. The beetroots are in season at the moment, so we've got them, so we're not oversized and overcomplicating and, uh, you know, really focused on doing every dish really well. With plans for their supper club underway, new signs for the Nook Eating House help promote a clear message. And the pub-like carpet that confused their identity is being replaced with a more appropriate flooring. Hello, young man. Look at this. I know. It's amazing, isn't Are it? Are you happy? Delighted. I can't even uh, get my head around it, yeah. So we've done the floor, we've done the lights. Now I've just got to put the place back together. Right, take this end. One thing I'm going to tackle is a kind of practicality. And the second thing I'm going to tackle is trying to make it flow a bit better. It'll be practical to have it here and it will separate off the room a bit. So there was one table here, wasn't there? Having previously seen a haphazard front of house, this new layout will help simplify and aid efficiency of service. So that can be at this end. I mean, this looks, already looks quite nice, Yeah. I think. The dated carpeted room has been transformed using wood flooring which is cost-effective and practical, lending a warm and cosy feel. It makes the perfect comfortable dining space for customers to linger longer and spend more money. It's incredible so far. I love the little touches with the uh, rosemary in the glasses. Really, really good. I think this is really exciting. I think it's so much fresher, cosier. 
quite pleased. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> this place is looking great. It's now all down to Malcolm and Christine to see if they can impress a local crowd with their first ever supper club. Two months ago, I was called in to help the Nook and Cranny, a failing restaurant piling pressure on the lives of owners Malcolm and Christine. But our plan to start a regular supper club could bring in a steady guaranteed income if they can pull it off tonight. Got a load of these fancy pies to make. I think once I've got them kind of constructed and built, I'll be a lot less stress. Sign looks good. That sign looks very good. Well, it looks better, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks open. It feels local. I think it looks amazing. Have a look. Is the menu changed? No, it's the same menu. I should go and have a little chat to Malcolm. OK, thanks, darling. Not best of start, I would say. Um, and it's sad because we're so excited about this evening. Uh, hopefully we'll regain some ground as we go along. Malcolm, 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 what is this? Oh, they're not out. They're not supposed to be there. Can we just go and look at the room and look at what we're doing tonight? Absolutely. Ah, what the, pathetic excuse have you come up with for oh. the fact that the menus haven't changed? In my defence, I was waiting for the logo. I've got that now. I then need to get that to the printers. Then I can get my menu sorted. I definitely all. want some printed menus. Come on. Yes. With or without the logo. How many people do we have coming tonight? 35. Is your menu costed? Absolutely. We might actually make some money tonight. But not nearly as much as they could be making, it seems. They bring in their own booze tonight, oh. so it's bring oh, your are own. They? Bring yes. your own? Yes. What sort of business is that? Well, this is what we learned from the supper club. This is what it's Oh, your licence. It's not bring your own. Well, we oh. thought that was a nice touch. But well, yeah, yes, not. it's a very nice touch for the customers, bring your but own. not a great touch for you. It's quite easy for two people to drink a bottle of wine between them. And um, it's a lost opportunity for revenue. It's an error that means he can't make a bit more money. So let's hope Malcolm's sums add up properly on the menu. Well, I broke the habit of a lifetime recently and actually sat down and costed it. Right. Took simple, cheap ingredients. Decided to use those as the base for the dishes, so I'm obviously saving money. We've got some pumpkins uh, that arrived yesterday for our arancini. Uh, we managed to get some local ham and chicken for my pies. All of the great meals I've had in my life have relied upon the chef having a relationship with the local produce. Yeah. You're going to build a lot of loyalty, both locally and as a food destination, when that comes to maturity. I really believe that. Yeah, I do now. Good evening, <laughs> Leo and Fiona. Come on in, Leo. Hiya, Matt. Have you seen their new menus? They're just starting their new lunch okay. and dinner menus. We saw the name change outside. What's burning, Matt? Um, how are you guys? All yeah, good? we're good. OK. Yeah, we're good. I think um, we're just going to need a little bit of communication, so I'll try and get hold of Chris in a sec, so we can try and determine start time. Unlike Nick and Jules's secret supper club, Malcolm has not made his evening a prepaid event. And with one group of diners yet to arrive... They're the five that haven't turned up. Having already budgeted for them, Malcolm could lose money. Take money up front for a supper club because it's a sales event. So essentially, you are pre-ordering a certain amount of food, you know, a certain amount of staff in, you know how many people are coming, you know what the profit margin is. It's business. You have to take the money up front. The delay has led to a further problem. It's nearly half past seven. I'm very keen for some food to start coming out. Our plan was for tonight to be the start of a loyal returning customer base. But their months of hard work could quickly go to waste if Malcolm and Christine buckle under the pressure. It is looking like people are desperate for something to eat. Oh, this can time to perfection, isn't it? For sake. No, mate, no. Like that. I think it's the nerves that are getting the better of me, but I just want it to go right. I think we start with the starters. Yeah? Yeah. There you go, sir. Thank you very much. If I just rudely lean across you there. Oh. Do excuse me stretching. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Are you all OK for drinks? 
But with Christine now starting to handle the service with confidence... Do you to help to clear up, then? <laughs> And with Malcolm in control... Can somebody stand there and get those folded so our second wave is decidedly quicker? The supper club is back on track. They're hot, darling. That's why I'm doing it like this. It's an encouraging sight. A dining room full of local customers enjoying the new local seasonal menu. And Malcolm enjoying a decent profit on the food. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, you're too kind. We've learned that it's all about seasonality and local produce, um, so I hope you get on board. That's our mission statement, and, um, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed the food so far. Thank you. Thank you. So, all good? Everyone happy? Yeah. Very well. Yes, very well. We've had a very good evening. It was great to sit with people and meet people. And the food, was, I have to say, was excellent. It's a step towards regular, guaranteed, profitable evenings and a step closer to Malcolm's dream of owning a successful restaurant becoming reality. How do you think tonight went? Honestly? Yeah. Hard work, but I enjoyed it. What do you think, darling? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. There was a really genuine smile on your face, which I haven't seen before. I saw you interacting with customers in a completely different way, which I loved. Everything that's still to be ironed out is structural. I mean, for example, you say that dinner is going to be served at a certain time, you start serving. Definitely. Take money in advance yes. for the supper club. Because, you know, the way you make money is that there's no food wasted. Mm -hmm. Don't do bring your own bottle. Make sure that you upsell. Do you know so, what? But once we now acknowledge there are holes, it's that process of filling them. It's important that you know you see this as an acorn and that you see the opportunity that's coming up. Because I love that new menu. Yeah. Great. Good luck. When we first met Malcolm and Christine, they were at rock bottom. But we've helped work through the problems. And now Malcolm has transformed himself from great chef to budding restaurateur, with Christine in full support. My test of a restaurant is would I come back? And the answer is yes, I would. I mean, I have a lot of faith in Malcolm's cooking. It's great. I've never seen Christine so positive. And I think she seems enthusiastic about the whole process now. They've got a great product here, and they are both looking ahead to the future very positively to make this place work. So it's our festive night in at the Nook this evening. Uh, we've got a small, intimate crowd. It's really good. I'm looking forward to a great night tonight. What do you like about the restaurant, Will? Um, playing with the phone. Playing with the phone? You're not supposed to play with the phone, are you? 